welcome everybody to another episode of Grow Yourself from the Inside Out. You know, you've if, if you know me, you know I've, I've spoken a lot about what we call limiting beliefs or limiting factors, those things that hold us back in life. And uh, But I've got a guest who takes this thing to a whole different level. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to kind of quickly read to you one of the one of the endorsers that uh, what they said a and he said I quote in giant in in be a giant killer Ed equips the reader to identify the enemies that hinder us and then conquer them and uh, you're going to be a little surprised here I got to tell you when you start to hear hear a story and then this really truly excellent book that came along with it. So before I bring Ed on, let me just kind of read, read his bio and uh, tell you a little bit about him. So Ed Norwood is the president of the Council of Reimbursement Advocacy. He is also an award-winning author of the book, Be a Giant Killer, Overcoming Your Everyday Goliaths. He has been recognized as a unique and distinctive authority in transitional leadership and administrative law laws and that govern the healthcare uh, delivery process. Ed has done hundreds of med media interviews and therefore we are so grateful that he's appearing here with us and lectures worldwide, uh, focusing on public policy, healthcare advocacy, leadership development and the lessons of, wait for it, the Jonestown tragedy. It's a fascinating uh, story that he's gonna tell us here. Multifaceted with creative ability, uh, Multifaceted with a cre creative ability to inspire his audience, Ed combines his business influence and expertise with his passion for ministry to help people flow in their dreams, destiny, and authority in life. I love that, to help people flow in their dreams, destiny, and authority of life. And so I'd like to welcome now uh, my guest here, Ed Norwood. Ed, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us on Grow Yourself. Hey, Kevin, thank you. Thank you for that gracious introduction. Again, for sharing your platform for me. Uh, I'm in California. I know that you're in, in Nashville. And so there's a bit of connection by the stream of people moving from Cali to Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and, and might I say a lot of people. Uh, you know, so, so the invitation is open, brother. Come on down. And, you know, there's room, you know, and we're running uh, out of room. It, it's such a beautiful city, man. It's a beautiful city. Yes, it is. You know, just really good, good city, good people. You know, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier that uh, my wife and I moved here 22 years ago and just wow. love it. We actually live in Murfreesboro. It's just slightly south. It's, I guess, okay. almost a bedroom community of Nashville, but um it's really, it's really wonderful. Oh, As a matter cool. of fact, cool. even Murfreesboro, and I know you're in the healthcare industry, at least work with healthcare. Uh, Murfreesboro is really growing, getting a lot of, wow. uh, lot of medical uh, healthcare wow. things out here. So listen, I did get a chance to read your book. It, as I said, not word for word, but a lot of it. And it's just, it blew my mind, honestly. It was fascinating from a lot of different angles that I wasn't expecting. And so before we get into it and hear about the giant killer and the ideas that you've put in this book, Ed, would you just first tell our audience, you know, who is Ed Norwood? Where do you, you know, where'd you come from? Where were you born? And just tell us a little bit about your background. Well, well, I am a husband, uh, a father, an entrepreneur. I've, I'm adding uh, author to that in the past uh, year or so, and um, and just a humble servant trying to make sure I deal with the giants in my life and get myself to heaven and help lead my family to heaven as well. I have been in Southern California since I, I wanna say 1996. My wife and I married in 1997. Uh, I was raised in the Bay Area. I know that you were based out there. I was raised in San Francisco. And of course that's where Jim Jones um, drew so many people into the jungles of South America. He had his headquarters there on Gary Street. Um, I went to high school. That's where I had my first exposure to the People's Temple. And um, since then, just been here. You know, I came out in 1996. I'm sorry, I came out in, I, 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 forgive me, I came out to California, uh, rather Southern California in 88. I see. Got married in 97 mm -hmm. and uh, joined a church called Melody Land Christian Center. And learned quite a bit there and had a chance to grow up in ministry and uh, really relearn and 
unlearn some things in life. And so I'm just grateful for this path that I'm on um, and grateful to be with you guys this morning as well. Goodness gracious. You know, the, the, you know, as a personal growth coach, I mean, you're kind of ticking all the boxes here that I'm going, oh yeah, self-awareness, you know, that whole picture. So <laughs> it's really good. But listen, before we, again, maybe even before we move forward, tell us a little bit about your work with the National Council of Reimbursement Advocacy. That's interesting. I had yes. never heard of it. Yes, we, we, we advocate for medically appropriate health care. Um, we, we challenge HMOs that make negligent medical necessity decisions to make sure that patients get the care they need um, pursuant to a case called Wickline versus State. Uh, in the Wickline versus State case, Lois Wickline is cleared for an abdominal aorta surgery. Her treating doctor wants to uh, observe her condition for eight days. Um, Medicaid, a federally funded payer, only grants a four-day authorization. Hmm. The doctor, out of fear of not being paid, releases the patient. She suffers an infection in her leg. And in 1977, they amputated her leg or she would have died. And so uh, we have interesting laws that exist, administrative laws, to make sure that what happened in Lois Wickline doesn't happen to you and I. And in many places, they're called health and safety codes. They are designed to protect public health and safety. So we teach doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals how to streamline administrative laws through the healthcare delivery process to protect people like you and I when we come into the hospital. Wow, man, that's, that's, uh, that's good work right there. You're really helping. Thank you. I would imagine a lot of people on all ends of that spectrum. So that's fantastic. Yeah, so, uh, just a lot of beautiful stories of us right? helping people who uh, couldn't help themselves, an, an underrepresented group of people fight the giant of a diagnosis or the giant mm. of a health plan denial. Well, you do say in your book that, the, you know, we'll talk about what the giants are, is that the giants can be, in fact, be the government or, or large corporations, yes. institutions that, you know, maybe, uh, listen, I think, I think sure. you know, as a, as a side note, some of these organizations are getting so large that it's very, sure. very hard to uh, you know, to, to um, push back if you have some, some issues that you want to deal with them about, it, you know, just overwhelm you with, with, uh, with the size, if you will, you know. Sure. So anyways, well, listen, yes. so, you know, uh, one, you know, I, honestly, there's there so many different directions that I kind of want to go. I don't know where to start, but I guess we'll just start with by asking you about your book, the, um, you know, and, you know, Giant Killers and, and where, you know, where that came from. Tell us a little bit about it. What's it about sure. and where, where, did, where did it start? Sure, sure. Well, when, when I first wrote the book, uh, I, I began to push it to a, a, literary, a, a literary agent rather, and it was about 15,000 words. And uh, I had a gentleman by the name of Les Stobe in North Carolina who grabbed it. And uh, he said, listen, I received your manuscript, but I want you to know that I'm retired. I'm no longer a literary agent. However, I'd like to mentor you because what you've sent me of 15,000 words is not a manuscript, it's a proposal. For you to create mm -hmm. a manuscript, you need 50 to 65,000 words. And I was floored. Uh, and so <laughs> uh, one of the things I've learned though over the course of time, even in, in ministry is I never preach or speak topically per se. Uh, sure, someone can give me a topic or a theme and I, could, uh, and I can create something around it, but I I'm always trying to teach from the place God is teaching me or teach out of the places of devotion where I hear his voice with great clarity. So uh, years ago, my pastor said, uh, if you're going to read the word of God, why should God speak anything to you if you're not going to write it down? So I have hmm. mountains of notebooks of me in the word of God, hearing something in a passage uh, and writing, hearing something and writing over worshiping and writing. And so I, I pulled everything together to create the 50 to 65,000 pages just through time I had spent in some of the darkest seasons of my life. 
Mm. Uh, Be a Giant Killer is a book about how seven giants kept an entire generation hostage for 40 years from their best life and what we, the next generation, are required to do about it. And if you think about it, Kevin, and God promised the Israelites a land of promise and potential, you know, houses they've not built, vineyards they've not planted, but he didn't hand over Jericho on a silver platter. Even though they stared at it for 40 years, they had to get a, after their parents died, they had to get a new word, a new leader. Uh, They had to bury bad family history. They had to cross over skeletons in the wilderness to get into their promised land. They had to make redemptive decisions, sending less spies in the land the second time. They had to cross the Jordan, uh, be circumcised or cut off from things that are carnal. They had to be healed for a season. March around Jericho for seven days. Shout, go in the city. Dispossess giants or things that were related to them and leave nothing alive to possess all that God promised them. And so I wrote this book to help readers face giants buried in family history, uh, to overcome past traumas, past mistakes, and shame to accomplish the wildest dreams in their heart, or to possess what's on the other side of the walls we erect in life. I I was reading this recently when the spies, the less spies went into Jericho, Rahab, the prostitute, shared with them, our hearts melted when you crossed the Red Sea and left Egypt. And I start thinking about how for 40 years, they were afraid of the giants who were in the land, not realizing that the giants were afraid of them. Oh, wow. And so I I really wrote the book to inspire survivors and readers, Christian or not, to overcome the tragedy, the bad data that we're operating off of, the toxic, the dysfunction, the crazy that's in our bloodline, the generational giants that keep passing down, passing down, passing down, giants such as fear and procrastination, addiction and shame. Um, And finally, I use as a backdrop my family's experience in the losing 27 relatives in the Jonestown dying a tragedy to illustrate how bad family history yeah. can be fatal to our dreams yeah, and wow. potential, but how we can rewrite it by being powerful giant killers. That's, that's crazy in a way, the connection that you made there, because I know, I don't recall if I read it in your book, but where you talked about the shame of your own family history and the shadow of your life, you know, that shadowed your life that you had to overcome. So if you would, Ed, you know, go ahead, maybe before we get more into, because I want to ask you, what are the giants? But first, maybe would you tell us about the Jonestown uh, massacre and your connection to that and, and a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Uh, my uh, mom was a traveling evangelist. And uh, when she traveled, she uh, left me in the care of my grandmother and great grandma, who were one of them was the first African-American family, our, our, our family was the first African-American family I've been told that joined People's Temple. And my mom in traveling left me in their care. And that's where my exposure really came uh, to Jim Jones and the People's Temple. Um, we, we have a, a generation, my publisher actually, or my editor asked me to do an intro before I started the book about Jonestown because we talked about how many generations aren't really aware of what took place in Jonestown 44 years ago. Uh, We have a generation that's heard of the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Yes. But they've never heard of the gruesome discovery that coined the expression. Uh, Many people don't realize that Jonestown was the largest loss of US civilian lives in a single day until 9-11. 900 people, a third of them who were children, are forced to drink poison at gunpoint or to be shot with bullets or crossbows. That was according to the Jonestown autopsy uh, and the pathologist there in South America. Uh, At the order of Jim Jones, they were ordered to drink poison, uh, who had just assassinated Congressman Leo Ryan. Yeah, I remember. But there's really a backstory that the book examines. And 
uh, to understand it, you have to go back to Genesis to the beginning. How did almost a thousand people get into Jonestown in the South America? Families following families, kids following mothers, mothers mm. following grandmothers. And, and it was reported after the event that many of those who were in Jonestown uh, who were taken there, they didn't have passports. My, my seven closest cousins were kidnapped to Jonestown. Uh, my mom began to have prophetic visions that uh, Jim Jones was going to kill our family in a jungle. He put out a hit on her and uh, she moved me to a suburb called Daly City uh, mm. and came off the road for a season that spared me from that kidnapping plot. But literally my uncle came home from work one day and all seven of his children were gone. The house was ransacked. His wife was gone. But by the grace of God, you know, I had the ability to survive. Wow. That's, that's something, you know. So, you know, tell the audience Joe, a little bit about Jim Jones and who he was. I mean, you know, I want to say that I was barely remembered, but because uh, this happened in 1978, is sure. that right? And sure. so, you know, just tell sure. the audience who, who may not know who Jim Jones was and just a, a quick synopsis of, of, of that sure. situation. Sure. Uh, well, he, he was, uh, when I describe him, uh, to them, he was their pastor, but Jim Jones uh, did not belong to the church. Mm -mm. He was an organization that did not believe in God. He stomped on the Bible in front of his congregation several times. He, he told them, whatever you need me to be, I'll be for you. If you want me to be mm -hmm. your father, I'll be your father. So many people called him father. Oh, I didn't know and that. He, um, he declared to them, I'll be your God. I'll be your Messiah. And it, it didn't start like that, though, because remember, in, in San Francisco, Jones had a foothold politically mm -hmm. where he came into uh, a region that was a fatherless region uh, mm -hmm. in a time where um, there was inequality and he preached a message of hope and inclusion. Mm -hmm. I, I remember uh, the different politicians, uh, President Carter and uh, mayors and uh, senators were in his pulpit. Uh, and he was, a, a, he was, I believe they would get given him some type of position over the housing authority. Uh, so he deceived quite a few people. He stole families and dreamers who wanted a better life through the racism, the disparity, the segregation, the poverty, the family dysfunction, uh, through, de through deception. And he told them it was better to ignore uh, uh, and run away from their history rather than change or restore their history. Uh, I remember um, visiting the temple and seeing why so many people were really drawn to him. I can't remember, Kevin, uh, a time when there wasn't free food or free toys. Uh, he met, he filled unmet needs uh, wow. strategically in a time of intense poverty, but there were also red flags. Uh, I remember going to the, to the temple one Sunday morning and it was a very eerie feeling in the, the room. So this and, temple that you're talking about is where? Uh, People's Temple. It was in San Francisco, so, headquartered okay. on Geary. Okay. Uh, he called it the People's Temple. Okay. And uh, we were there. I was there with my cousins. And uh, it was a, just a chilly feeling in the air. And later, uh, some of his members came and they erected a, a boxing ring out of the pulpit. And I guess a young boy had broken a girl's leg. He, was, uh, he had to be five years old. He had broken the girl's leg either, either out of mischief. Yeah rough housing, playing too hard or by accident. Mm -hmm. But his punishment was three rounds in this boxing, this makeshift boxing ring with a eight year old boy who pounded him into unconsciousness. Uh, in, in between the rounds, the eight year old boy would go get water in the corner where Jim was. And the five year old boy would almost be in the verge of collapse in his corner with no one there. And uh, while many people sat horrified but unfortunately, there were many that cheered every punch that he delivered. And the message to every family's child that day was this. Whatever happened to this five-year-old boy will happen to you if you act out, if you misbehave. Wow. You cannot hide. 
we will find you. And, and that's really what happens with bad family history. We feel it dooms us into a death sentence to keep repeating the disease patterns that we've seen. And uh, Jonestown is a testament of how the wrong relationship and how parental decisions can really be fatal, fatal in life. You know, this, this, and I won't presume anything about the families that went to Jim Jones, because I don't know enough of it, but just in listening to you, you know, I can, I know that many of these groups, regardless of, you know, you know, what the persuasion is, you know, whether it's the, you know, the KKK, sure. it could be, you know, the, sure. you know, any, any dissident sure. group if, or, sure. or, you know, sure. hate group, if you will. Sure, sure. They, they, um, we know that one of the things that's most appealing about them is that they do, and you said it earlier, they do fulfill a need. Yes. You yes. know, and that many of the people that get involved in these sorts of things, again, whether it's a gang, KK, it doesn't matter sure. what it is. Yeah, that's they good. They draw that's you good. in because you suddenly, you know, interesting enough that these people who are, you know, badasses, if you will, sure. that are sure. tough sure. people, they're still looking for love. Sure. They're still looking sure. for acceptance. And sure. in your way of thinking, is that how this happened with Jim Jones? Because you have to wonder, 900 people, that's a lot of, well, okay, so a third of them are, are kids, but yes, you know, how does a person like this get such a hold on folks? Yes, yes. I, I think that's so powerful what you shared. Um, you know, what happened to my family in Jonestown, the victims there, really happens in America every single day. Correct. We run from problems. Mm -hmm. We fail. We make mistakes. Mm -hmm. We stay in comfort zones or ignore red flags. Yes. We cower in shame uh, or guilt. We fear change. We get it misunderstood. Uh, we fight bouts of depression, we ignore symptoms, we stay in unhealthy and destructive and abusive and familiar and relationships out of fear. We die prematurely taking our dreams to the grave. But the book is really about Jesus more than, than Jim. It is, it's about, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> It's Which about family, that. yeah, it's about family history more than the failures of my 27 relatives who uh, died in Jonestown, yet it paints on that backdrop and uh, really uh, issues and summons individuals to become truth tellers in their generation, to become giant killers, to oppose things that have been taunting our predecessors our parents and their parents for 40 years as Goliath taunted the Israelites for 40 days to help them ensure that they don't keep repeating the bad family history. Uh, oftentimes, we don't realize that we can transmit the traumas and the fears that we don't heal to the next generation. And so I kind of use that story to really demonstrate how we can escape the shame of bad family history uh, yeah. in our lifetime. You know, that, uh, of course, the story that you know so well, sure. you know, it, it's, it's to the, you know, it's to the far end of the spectrum, if you sure. will. However, what you're saying that this story that you use it as an analogy or metaphor to so many other things, I mean, I can sure. think of my own history, Mm -hmm. In life, growing up with a really tough dad, you know, who was yes. really tough yes. and hard on me yes. and, and others. He, he just passed yes. a year ago. God rest his soul. But, um, you know, but you, you can take those things. How many times have we heard of that? You can repeat sure. these things, these cycles, yes. and start treating your own kids like that. And then they treat their kids like that. And yes. I was conscientious of yes. whatever issues I had. And, and I, you know, uh, I developed a beautiful, beautiful relationship with my father here, most even mostly in the recent years before he passed. Yes. So there's there's nothing there for me now as sure. far as any anger or whatever the case might be. But no doubt you, at the simplest level, 
you begin yes. to repeat what you've already known. That's somewhat yes. what you're talking about. Now, again, yes. what yes. you're talking about is to a much greater degree uh, yes. in terms of people that no, fall. No, that's powerful. That, that's uh, powerful what you actually shared. Yeah. I was telling my wife recently that um, God is no respecter of pain. And I want just to explain that just for a minute. I'm not trying to state that there aren't some things that are more painful than others. Right. But God sees all pain. Not a thing is hidden in his sight. He sees everything that injures and wounds us. Yeah. Um, I don't have to have a son that was left on a doorstep or uh, left on a bus and abandoned by me. Uh, uh, just some of the hard ways I was on my oldest son uh, on curfew can be a painful, traumatic thing that um, he can struggle with in his adulthood. And God is just as concerned about that pain as the pain of someone abandoned in a street by their family. Mm. I am, um, I'm a recovering helicopter parent, probably realize that. And um, <laughs> I've learned that you can do something from a place of love that still misses the yes, mark. Right? Yes, no, it still screams. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah that, that still screams to your adult yeah. children. I need control or yeah. I, I can't trust you to make your own decisions. Yeah. I've got three kids. Uh, one's 31, one's 24, one's 21. And two of my kids, if I ask them, they're leaving and I ask them, Hey, where are you going today? They will hear Kevin. Yes. Where do you think you're going today? I listen, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I had to learn how to unparent myself, un, un, unparent our relationship. Yep, I get it, well, man. It, yeah, and because that's in our history, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and I, I was with my son, my oldest son recently, and uh, he, he wasn't, he had to go to the doctor and he wasn't really um, taking the initiative I wanted. And I started raising my voice and I can see him begin to shrink. And I realized that I was triggering a hurt yeah. from his childhood when I didn't yeah. allow him to feel understood. Yeah. Uh, because when my kids were, were growing up, I, I realized that while I was a great encourager, yeah. I wasn't a great comforter to them. Um, I, my mom traveled, uh, as an evangelist. So from age 14 to 18, I kind of raised myself in the home. I had to give myself chicken soup if I wasn't feeling well. I had to tell myself, will myself to go to school and to do my homework. And I had a little advice column, Kevin, in high school called Dear Ed, like Dear Abby. Mm. And here I was trying to encourage and inspire the lostness and the aloneness in kids, but really trying to inspire myself. And so when my kids would go through things, it was always giving them a great word. You can do exceedingly and abundantly and far above. You ask, dream, think, hope, or imagine. Nothing's impossible with God. You can be uh, something that your generation has never seen. I had all the encouraging words to give them, but I, I rarely would sit down with them uh, and say, hey, I know you had a big game today and you didn't do as well as you would have liked and your team lost. And I, that must have been so difficult for you. How are you getting through that? Hey, I know tomorrow was a big test and you're sick and you really prepared for it and you won't be able to go. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry that you won't be able to take this test and you have to make it up. How are you getting through that right now? I, I rarely did those kind of things. So in this season of my life, I'm beginning to excavate unresolved hurts and embarrassments and have heart talks and conversations with my kids. Um, son, when you were 13 and this happened on the football field and I made you go and confront the coach and the players on this thing, I realized that I embarrassed you in that season. And really that was just dad's pride. And I'm so sorry. I harmed you. I hurt you by that. Will you ever forgive me? Wow. And I'm seeing God do some powerful, powerful things with that. Wow. Wow. And that's, that, that is powerful just in and of itself. Listen, I just like to read a little piece before we, uh, cause I really want to dig into your book and learn about the giants, but there was a sure. piece that I read up front and 
I'll just read it out loud and then just, you know, just have a couple of you know, questions, I guess sure. you could say. Uh, some of what you've already said here, it said, when I was eight years old, 27 of my relatives were massacred by the cult leader, Jim Jones, in the Jonestown, Jonestown Guyana tragedy. And then, then you said, the shame of my own family history shadowed my life. But here's the other part that I want to ask you about. And you said, until I discovered the lessons revealed in this book, a searing expose of how our history can influence our legacy. So, you know, so let's, let's dig into that. What, what are, you know, what are some of the, the big lessons that you learned? And then my next question is, you know, what, what are the giants that you talk about in this book? Sure, sure. Well, uh, they say, I heard a quote maybe 10 or 15 years ago that said uh, 80 to 90% of how we observe things occurs by the age of five or six. Oh, say that again. 80 to 90% of how we observe things occurs by the age of five or six. Oh, fascinating. So by that age of six, however we are observing things, we carry that for the rest of our life. Our history, unless we rewire some things, right? Uh, or we unlearn some things. Our, our history really shapes our relationships, how we respond to people and places and reactions and things. Uh, I heard a therapist say on the radio recently, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. Uh, <laughs> another author <laughs> said this, I can't tell if my mother is terrified or in love with my father. It all looks the same. Oh, wow. Ooh. So we underestimate how wow. our family history affects everything that we do in life. And, um, you know, shame is a dream killer, Kevin. Yeah. It will keep you from pursuing your calling. It'll keep you from pursuing the love of God on your life. Shame creates a performance mentality that says, I can never rest. It convinces me to constantly try and prove myself to people. And it, it's it can become exhausting mm. trying to constantly defend yourself, trying to defend your worth and your value and your significance, uh, trying to always be enough or make someone see you or make someone proud of you. And so the message of shame is this, you will never be worth anything and you don't deserve true love or forgiveness. You got what you received. It attacks our being and our worth. And, and, and as I'm looking at the, the shame of family history, uh, I, I begin to just teach people how to identify the things that are buried in their lives. Um, um, I was year 10 of my marriage, we were on the verge of divorce. And we went to a place called the National Inst Institute of Marriage it's in Branson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And the therapist there said, this week we are here to rewire your heart mm -hmm. because our hearts are like black boxes. And I began to do some research about black boxes because it's this little indestructible piece of metal under the pilot seat in the cockpit. And if a plane suffers catastrophic failure and plunges from the sky into the ocean, and breaks into pieces, there's mass, mass casualties. Government, the government will send divers past the debris, past the chaos, past the casualties to look for this little black box because it remembers. It remembers the good. Welcome to United. You will have a six hour flight to Nashville because everyone's leaving California to Nashville. <laughs> we'll feed you, we'll give you a movie, yeah, uh, uh, have right. some service several times, enjoy the flight. Yeah. And it remembers the bad, May Day, May Day, fire in the cockpit, prepare for crash landing. Mm. And Kevin, that's our heart. Mm. It remembers everything, everything. every celebration, every achievement, every milestone, every disaster, every pandemic, every rejection, every heartbreak, every betrayal, every abuse, every injustice. They say the heart knows no time or can't tell time. 
And inside this little black box, there's a little boy and a little girl crying to be heard. And so um, we've learned that in the book of 1 John 3, 20, that if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So God has the power, the blood of Jesus is stronger than our family history. And when God restores our heart and renews our heart, he makes it better than new. He doesn't need to repeat the old. He makes all things new, better than it was before. He gives this little boy crying for an audience a voice for the first time. He gives the unresolved pain and the resentment and the dysfunction a voice, no matter how many people have tried to silence it. And so I've kind of put the book together to help people find their voice in life Mm. to defeat or confront some of the giants that exist. Um, And um, we, we kind of jump into it. I know that you were talking about some of the giants earlier and so forth. Um, But we'd be surprised at how, how, how simple the giants are. We've identified them, but how simple they are. Um, A friend of mine had a kids, adult kids. He was estranged from and, He was struggling to make the first move. And as fathers, we must constantly chase our children. We must constantly leave a legacy of love for them so that when we go and when they bury us, that they'll never doubt the love that we had for them. Mm -hmm. We must give them an extravagant type of love just as God gives to us. And he was struggling to make the first move. And he said, I never heard my father tell me I'm sorry. So I'm Mm. struggling to apologize to my children. Mm. I never heard him ever say I was wrong. And I looked at him with clear, transparent eyes and said to him, isn't it exciting that we get to change that in our generation? That we don't have to look the same. We don't have to pass things down to us that have been passed down and passed down and passed down we can be the best of our generation. Wow. Isn't that the truth? That is, th- those are powerful words. And, and they're also, uh, I'm going to say for me, and there's no question in my mind for the listeners and the viewers of this podcast, that this is an affirmation that mm. it's something you can do. And, uh, you know, I, I suppose I won't be too forward to say, and you should do. Yes. You know, if, if the spirit moves you, I, I know, um, you know, e- even with our kids, you know, we have to, we have to imagine that they have the capacity to understand. Sure. Once you come to them and say, listen, uh, you know, there's, there's times that I could have been better. Sure. There's times that I, I showed that I, that I disciplined you when I probably should have loved you more, even though I disciplined you out of love and sure. And, you know, and, or I gave you what my parents gave me, or I gave you what my parents gave me, (laughs) you know, and your, and your kids, you know, and I've, I've done some of this. I mean, I had a great relationship with all my kids and awesome. Awesome. You know, but I wasn't the perfect parent by any stretch of the imagination. And and there are things that, you know, you, you know, that I might've said to my daughters and, and both of them were like, sure, dad, you know, I mean, we understand, we know you loved us and sure. you did everything sure. that you could. I mean, you know, and so they're capable of sure, sure. not only forgiving you of just showing you grace sure. and, and moving on, you know, sure. but, but it must be to some, you know, whether it's that, inst- whether it's a series of things that you have to say, or just sure. saying it one time. Sure. I, I love think- that. Well, I think I love the that, kids, Kevin. They, they just appreciate the humility and they say, okay, yes. Yeah. You know, cause even with my dad and again, my, I, you know, my dad, he was, it was a tough guy. He loved us. I don't think there's any question about sure, it, Sure. but I didn't understand that as much as I was a kid. And I can also honestly tell you there was at least three occasions sure. in my life where I could see my dad standing there and he was trying very hard to apologize. Yeah. Well, you know, so he, 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 so he may have not come right out with the words and yeah, said, Hey, yeah, Kevin, so I was powerful. so tough, but I knew yes. it. 
Yes. And, and I remember one particular time, this was, this was probably only, well, it was when I retired from the Air Force, you know, we were standing around and I when, when you know, and he was there and my brothers were there and he was, of course, retired army, special forces, you know, bronze star, you know, uh, Green Beret, he, you know, he was just the badass of the badasses. Yeah, yeah. And I remember at the reception after my retirement ceremony, you know, we were standing sure. and I think looking at some gifts that some folks had given me and 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 he was and I could just hear him, you know, talking about I, I sure. wished I would have. He he never really completed a sentence. And I just sure. looked at him and you know and 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 put my arm around him. I said, Dad, listen, you know, especially now as a father, I I, I get it. I understand. I love it. I, I love, love you, that. You know, and and it was a healing moment really for both of us, I think. There, there was um, you know, I told someone recently that um I don't have the hereditary right to be around my adult kids. <laughs> I have to earn that right every single interesting, day. Interesting, very interesting statement. By my behavior, by how I treat their significant yeah. others. Yeah. Uh, Mitch Albom once said this, love is how we stay alive even after we're gone. Oh, goodness gracious. And my wife and I have decided above all else that we just, we wanna leave, as I mentioned before, a legacy of love. Yes. To leave a legacy of love, we have to rewire our hearts. We have to stop making people pay for where others left us. Mm. We have to stop responding to conflict the way we saw our predecessors respond to conflict. Yeah. And we can't live with a heart that's filled with regrets. Uh, so it's good to take time now to remember what we can remember because I can't even remember where my car is parked in the parking lot sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, while we can remember to yeah. bring up some of those things yeah. that we know that our kids need to hear from us. How do we know that our yeah. kids need to hear yeah. from us these things? Because there are some things that we still need to hear from our parents or we may never hear from our parents mm. growing up. That kind of shapes where we are. And, um, wow. you know, we, we really leave a legacy of love by being empathetic, by, by not spiritualizing everything yeah. or, or, or not saying things like, well, it is what it is. No, it is what people have made it. That's correct. That's exactly by, right. By, 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 by making sure that we have a self-awareness, as you mentioned earlier, having heart talks that says, hey, where did that come from? Man, wow, what's going on inside of me right now that made me say that or, or do that who am i angry at mm. what am i afraid of why am i like this man why did that why did that trigger me it, it, and if you never experience empathy or comfort as a child it's very difficult to give it boy that's the truth that was exactly what was in my head as you were speaking because i yeah. thought to myself to your point that one, just what you said, that you learn how to empathize when you when you have observed it and mostly when it's happened to you. And so yes. in doing something like this that you're talking about, I think to, if I may use this term that I don't particularly like, but you know, you give your kids permission to to do the same. Oh, I love that. That's powerful. Right. Because well, now so, they can so, empathize. So I love that word permission because in business, I teach business owners mm -hmm. uh, for you to do what you want to do in your industry. You need to have the ability to earn trust. Mm -hmm. And when you earn trust, people will give you permission to do your finest work. There you go. And so that's powerful what you just shared. Man, that's fantastic. So I'm going to read another little piece here um, sure. and, and, then, and then jump really more into the, the giant killers themselves. So this came from chapter one, page 17, if anybody wants to know. And I do re highly recommend this book, by the way. It says giant killers represent a person or thing marked by exceptional, exceptionally giant, uh, great size, marked by exceptionally uh, giant size, magnitude, extraordinary power, significance, or importance. Giants exist to intimidate you to inaction, to not finish what you started, not follow up, not fight for your destiny, not protest your rights to improve life skills or prevent future injury, not sharpen your weapons, or be great. And so 
and then you go on in chapter two, and I'll just read them for you, but I'd sure. love to hear more about them. So sure. you say that there are uh, giants of all kinds, and what you list are these giants, the giant of doubt, mm. fear, addictions. Mm. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. No, the, the seven giants of fear, dissatisfaction, unforgiveness, addiction, laziness, procrastination, that's a pretty big giant of mine <laughs> and, and folly, which I'm curious mine about. Do. Mine so, too. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's a giant giant, you know, sometimes, you know, so talk about these giants a little bit more, uh, Ed, you know, especially, you know, I, if I may start with the giant of folly, I, that one, I didn't see coming. Yeah. Um, when you think of the word, folly. It's quite an interesting term. Yeah. Uh, and I believe it was the last giant. Uh, it represents the Jebusite. Uh, folly is defined as a lack of good sense or foresight. Uh, it can be characterized as our foolishness, mm. um, <laughs> rash decisions, because anything hasty is of the enemy. Uh, and folly has destroyed humanity more than cigarettes, alcohol, <laughs> drugs, heart disease and, and cancer. Don't get me started. <laughs> Just a little folly can become a big giant in our lives. Uh, it spoils any wisdom and honor we have built. It will rot and send a vile smell in our leadership and our dreams and our anointing. It'll make us feel foolish and disqualified, or unworthy of the call of God on our life. Uh, Solomon wrote this, um, in Ecclesiastics uh, 10 and 1, as dead flies cause even a bottle of perfume to stink, so a little folly or a little foolishness spoils great wisdom and honor. And so um, the, Jeb the Jebusite uh, represents the giant of folly. And we see King David in the book of 2 Samuel 5, 6 facing this giant. And, um, and it says this, Kevin, David then led his men to Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites, the original inhabitants of the land who were living there. And the Jebusites taunted David saying, you'll never get in here. Even the blind and the lame could keep you out. And the Jebusite giant wants to crush your dream of being king or queen to take your authority away from you through foolish, rash decisions to prevent you from growing into your potential, into who God has called you to be, uh, to stunt your growth, to keep you stagnant, to make you feel insignificant or ashamed of some of the things that you've tried to walk in in your life. Um, this giant tramples and treads and humiliates and stomps us at our weakest points and really pacifies us uh, to offer cheap rewards, um, cheap sacrifice in life. Ed, so I'm gonna say this, um, you know, I'm a patriot through and through. I do love this country. I, yeah. I, I love the country even with all of its uh, ills and past sure. histories and sin. And, and the reason I do which I think has, this is just my observation and opinion, is because um, we've lost, you know, why we have grown to love this country, you know, even with, with all the problems we've had. And that was, it, to me, it's as simple as this, that what makes American great and what sure. made American great, you know, and so different than any country in the world is that you could come here with 10 bucks yes. in your pocket Yes, an idea yes, and yes. grow that thing. Yes. See yes. that that was that was the original idea yes, of what yes. was happening here. So you know, awesome. with all of that said, so so that's why I'm a patriot through and through. But Love I got to tell you, uh, uh, I, I'm my heart is hurting because and and because I ask this: What is wrong with this country? What is wrong sure. with us? And I'll be honest with you. I think you just nailed it. I think you just answered the wow. question for me wow. that we have gone down this road of, of growing this giant folly. Yes. yes, yes. It's everywhere. Yes, 
Yes. And you 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 and you're right. It's it's torn a lot of countries and a lot of I mean, you know, you don't sure. probably need to go any farther than sure. the Roman Empire, but sure. that's a fascinating thought that you're bringing up there for sure. me. Sure, sure. And and I think um you know, I was sharing someone that sharing with someone recently that um to remind myself that human imperfect messy relationships mm. nailed a perfect Jesus to the cross. Well, say that again, one more time. Human imperfect messy yes. relationships nailed a perfect Jesus to the cross. So when we're trying to restore family history, it may not or restore where we should be as a family or restore um, the anointing and the calling as a father on our life or restore our, our, our authority as a son in the house or a son to our parents. When you're trying to face a giant of history, mm. it's scary. Mm. It can rupture some relationships. Mm -hmm. I was in a men's retreat some years ago and my pastor stopped and he, he prayed for me uh, and he kissed me on the cheek and he said, I'm kissing you on the cheek because you never experienced the kiss of a father. And I'm telling you, I love you today because you never experienced the love of a father, but I want you to know that I love you. Goodness and I just started crying uncontrollably. I imagine. And it wasn't as if I needed to call my dad who wasn't in my life and say, you need to kiss me. Yeah, no, no, I get it, yeah. But, but, but for years I had devalued the role of a father mm. in even my son's life, my mm. kid's life. Uh, my wife would ask me all the time, man, you weren't with your, your mom and dad weren't, in fact, she was a giant killer before I even wrote the book. She, she would say early on, uh, <laughs> you know, hey, you know, your mom and you weren't, you weren't raised by your mom and dad, that must've been hard. And I'd always say to her, nope, I was fine. My mother was my father and my mother. I was just, I was okay. And, and, and I, I would, that was my go-to because I, I heard my mom say that over and over and over again. And as I began to write this book, I realized that I had to start, uh, stop underestimating the power of a conversation and start having them. So I remember going to my mom and asking her, hey, why don't you and dad work out? And she said, man, Eddie, he used to make promises to you and you'd get really, really excited and then he wouldn't show up and you would just start crying uncontrollably. And the, I only, up to this point, I only remembered one experience with my father and all of a sudden I started crying uncontrollably. It's as if I had buried all of those feelings, all the pain, all the shame, all the rejection. And in that moment, I remembered it and it came out. Uh, back, back to the, the, the kiss in the encounter. I called my dad afterwards because a Ill elderly man was in the hospital in our church and he was away from his kids through a divorce. And I saw the impact of how his kids were affected by that. And I shared with him, you know what I would have loved for my dad to do is to say to me, Son, I'm sorry that me and your mom didn't work out. I'm sorry that I wasn't there with you in the meaningful times of your life. And um, after I shared this with him, he talked to his daughter and they reconciled a bit. And I decided to try it on my dad, <laughs> having this conversation. And God warned me, it may not happen the way, or you might not get the response yeah, you, you want. Manage them <laughs> expectations. <laughs> but, but, but this, without any expectation, this is your freedom moment. And so um, I remember sharing with my dad saying, man, dad, why weren't you around? And I, I wish I really needed you when I was growing up. And Kevin, he, on the phone, he shared with me, son, I don't even know if I'm your father. Ooh. And Ooh. I remember hearing it and being angry mm. and being hurt. And then trying to say, man, if that happened to you, I'm, I'm sorry that you went through that. And it was in that season that God taught me that I'm not in charge. It's not important for me to counsel my own family history. Um, I don't need to help 
my dad in that scenario um, where I'm feeling hurt or insignificant, but I do have a responsibility to bring my hurts and my failures to the cross and ask God to make me a living sacrifice. Man, maybe my feelings were sacrificed by what my dad said. Maybe some insensitive things happened and they sacrificed my heart when they did those things. But God, you said you would make me a living sacrifice. That I would live beyond those things and I could learn to lay down my lives not unto death, but unto, unto life. Not unto anger or resentment, but unto restoration and joy. Um, Steve Arterburn writes a book. He has a ministry oh, called New Life. Uh, and and he, he, he says a quote. He says, the greatest way to honor an estranged parent, dead or alive, is to become the human that they couldn't help you become. And so we can't medicate our own fa bad family history. We have to confront. We have to acknowledge. We have to grieve man, that was abuse when I went through that. That wasn't really the best way to parent. Oh man, what I said to my kid back then, that was wrong. I've got to repent from that. We have to confess our sins. And the Bible says in Nehemiah 9 too, that we're also to confess the sins of our ancestors. Whoa. Whether, whether in family or whether in a nation. Wow. 9 two, great powerful scripture. It says on the 24th day of the month, the Israelites gathered fasting, wearing sackcloth, putting dust on their head. And those of Israelite descent separated themselves from the foreigners and they stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. And when they did, it sparked a revival of repentance because it's not enough to know our family history, Kevin. We've yeah. got to repent from it. It's simple prayers. Lord, I repent for the sins of my mom and dad not providing for me, not um, taking accountability for their stark absence in my life. I repent for the sins of parents who were silent, who were critical, who were abusive, who did not listen or comfort me in known or unknown hurts disappointments and rejections. I repent for extending my ancestral anger and unforgiveness to my children, not validating their questions, their whys in life, for saying no without explanation, for loving with provision and encouragement, but not with words, with comfort and understanding. And when we learn to repent for not just our sins, but for where those sins were passed down, through god brings great restoration and revival dude that is just that's extraordinary you know but but i have you know i feel like i have so much so many things to repent is there like one that can kind of cover all of it you know because <laughs> i spend the rest of my life you know uh, wow man that's really well, I mean, yeah stuff. yeah that's a, that's a good point god i'm <laughs> sorry for being i'm sorry for not being a, the greatest dad but yeah, you know yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah, we're hard on ourselves yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, yeah, yeah. our only job is to yeah, yeah. try to deal with the things that our parents left behind. Right. And when we die, right. our kids are going to have to clean up some things as well and take some of the good things and build the next generation and fix some of the bad things. And there, and there it is. You know, it, I, I think you, if I understood it correctly, the, the one, one big idea from what you just said is this notion of, you know, what, what, hill are you going to die for is it is it yes. for is it you know for you know are you going to die for the sins of your father your mother yes the, you know all, all of these sorts of things are you going to are you going to lay your life down uh, yes. for, trying to lift other people up yes you know which yes. which one is it i mean and yes. and i think many of us it's it's perhaps fairly natural because of the way that our brains are sort of wired to be protective and uh and and so forth that that we just we live in pain we live for the pain instead of living for the healing and you know mm -hmm. that it's an interesting concept you're bringing out here that i not sure that i've heard this before about powerful yeah. jesus said these works shall you do and greater think about the sacrifice mm. him becoming naked and exposed on Calvary mm -hmm. for us. 
He said, these works shall you do in, in greater. And I believe that we have the responsibility through Jesus, our giant killer, our savior, and our champion who saves us from things that are stronger than us. I believe we have this responsibility to do these works and do greater. Whatever we saw our predecessors do, whatever good we can pull from it and do greater. Whatever greatness we can pull, whatever, if they taught us the word of God, these works and greater. If they taught us to be providers for our family, these works and greater. If they taught us to um, encourage our kids, these works and greater. I believe that call is upon our life. That's just really powerful. You know, uh, Ed, there's, there's, uh, there's so many different uh, places that we can go. And I, I'm just going to at this point, because we're, you know, just running a little bit, uh, you know, we're getting closer to the end of the podcast here. But I, I just really encourage, I mean, I don't think I really need to encourage anybody that's listening or watching this to go read your book, because I'm assuming uh, as I'm compelled to go back and read it deeper, that it will compel others to read it. Mm -hmm. I do want to ask you about this board before, uh, and I'm going to ask you about where people can find you and sure, make sure. contact with you and that sort of thing. But in in uh, you you talk about near near the end of the uh, the book about uh, you know three things about the critical spirit. Mm -hmm. crit I, I found that fascinating, and mm -hmm. and the three and again I'll just read them out loud. Sure. Uh, is, you know, a critical spirit will keep you in a desert. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, a critical spirit may exist in the gap between what you are getting and what you are expecting. And then finally, a critical spirit must be cut off. So mm -hmm. maybe just mention a little bit about what is the critical spirit. And, and then, you know, and then these ideas, especially about, you know, maybe we, we could say a solution that the critical spirit must be cut off. Mm, what is a critical spirit, good. first of all? Um, you remember that in the wilderness, there were people who were critical of Moses. Yes. And when they went into the, sent the 12 spies into the promised land, 10 came back with a critical spirit. And their mindset was, the land of the people who are in the land are giants and we're like grasshoppers oh. in their sight and oh, wow. in ours. Oh, wow. And oftentimes that critical spirit will sabotage our best life or sabotage the obedience that we need to function in. Uh, a critical spirit is one that simply says, well, it is what it is. Well, they'll never change. That's just grandma. That's just dad. They were like that. Their mother was like that. That had never changed with them. And we become desensitized to the things that are hanging from our family tree. We spiritualize things even at times. And then, of course, we teach our kids how to marginalize things in life. We pass that down to them where no one is ever working on anything. I was sharing this with someone recently that really we change the next generation by changing ourselves. And no matter how the critical spirit was passed down to us, because remember we observe things, how we observe things occurs by the age of five to six. Our kids are constantly watching us as Absolutely. children, as adults, they see everything. Even as adults, they're watching us. Uh, how we respond to uh, the preacher that preached that Sunday and how uh, it, if we're talking about the preacher at lunch afterwards, that critical spirit that exists, they, they, they learn that. We, 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 we pass that down to them. Goodness and gracious. so um, oftentimes I find that we'll work on things like our credit history, but not our family history. Uh, we'll work on things uh, that pertain to uh, our financial wealth, but not the wealth of our inheritance that we're passing down to our children. Uh, when I was first, uh, when I was growing up, uh, my, uh, I think it was, I was actually 18 or 19, I got my first credit card, it was $500. 
and I was excited, Kevin. And uh, I took my coworkers, I told my coworkers, I wanted to take them out to dinner on this $500 credit card. And my oldest colleague, her name was Paula Strode. And I, I thought she had a critical spirit back then, but she said to me, don't you do that. She pulled me to the side and said, don't you do that. And I said, listen, no, I'm, I'm taking everyone out. I want to celebrate this credit card. And little did I know that a landslide of bad decisions would follow until my credit score was 500. And I learned that you can't pray a bad credit score up. You can't. <laughs> my credit history wasn't great. I've been asking, Lord, why? You know, not anymore. You know, but there was a time Lord, I was like, Lord, I, I'm can you leading, just... I'm believing for 800 right now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Lord, Jesus. give me a 750, 750 when they run this credit. Okay, 745, when, I'll take when it. They, <laughs> Lord, 730, when they run this credit card, please let it go through. You really can't pray okay. a bad credit score up, right? Right. <laughs> my, my credit history wasn't great, but I transformed it by making better decisions. Mm. By making payments on time, paying cards down and off, yeah. disputing things in my history that weren't there, making different decisions, increase my score from 500 to 775. Because we change our destiny by changing our history. And no matter what's in our history, no matter who hurt us, who left, who was critical, who abandon us. No one can steal our legacy because our legacy is comprised of the, the decisions we make today. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people the great news is we're always making history. If you were critical in your life in one season, you can restore family history and be a different person today than your kids have ever seen, dreamed, hope or imagine. Uh, you might be around some people who are very critical and you may have to create some boundaries to protect your heart. You may have to have honest conversations and love and get sad instead of getting mad to make sure that you don't perpetuate that critical spirit to your children, but they're worth it. The inheritance we leave behind, it's worth it for us to do the work. Man, that is so, that is just incredible words that you're saying there. I will say that I, and I've probably said this on this podcast before that I, I, I thought that my legacy statement on my gravestone would probably be something like, you know, he tried really hard, you know, I mean, because, you know, but listen, um, so a couple of quick questions and then we're going to sign off here, but sure. one, how did, you know, how did Ed Norwood, you know, how did you end up, Ed, you know, really being a, a powerful voice that I hear you, a powerful man and human being, uh, really a, a beautiful person that I can, I can sense here. You know, why, how, how, come, how come Ed Norwood ended up here and others end up, you know, in gangs or in prison or something like mm -hmm. this? Mm, you know, mm. or, or, or in any, or, or yeah, broke, yeah. or, or, I mean, it's just yes. a whole number of things. I mean, yes. you, you see, it seemed as though you, you know, I mean, I don't know enough about your life to maybe, you know, presume sure. this, but, but it seemed the ingredients were there for you to go in another direction. And, mm. and so ultimately I am asking, you know, sure. What do others do? Sure. Sure. That's a great question. You and know, and again, I, I apologize I became, if there's things that I don't know. I no, mean, no, I, it's, it's, know, quite, it's yeah. quite powerful what you're asking yeah. because you asked the question of how mm. I became who I am. Yeah. It was through a lot of mistakes, um, through going through seasons of great loss, of great wilderness. Yeah, I characterize the wilderness as temporary confusion. Mm. And uh, when I was 18, I started my first business and made a lot of money, Kevin. Wow. And because I made a lot of money, I made a lot of mistakes and I ended up losing that business. And I learned a lot in loss. And I remember in those seasons of wilderness where nothing was working, nothing was growing, 
Nothing I planted was coming out of the ground. God was just trying to teach me that you will not live by bread or by resources alone, but by every word that proceeds out of my mouth. And it was in that season I learned to trust him. I learned that if I lost, started a business and lost it all over again, that he could take, from, from, take me from nothing and make me something. And I'll just say this, we're still making history. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right now. That's true. Right every now. decision we make is still making history. And I'm just trying to make a mound, create a mound of good decisions that overwhelm the bad ones. Wow. There you go, man. As we're making family history, it means that we're still writing chapters in our life. And it's never too late to accomplish the biggest dream in your heart, to face. They, they, they wander for 40 years in front of a walled city with giants. It's never too late to conquer what's in front of you, what's eluded you for years. Um, that word, um, we talked a lot about history today. History is the study of change over time. Mm. Change is something different from what occurred in the past. And it comes suddenly when opposites push against each other. And when we push against our history to be the best of our generation, we become not just history makers, but history takers. We may not be able to erase bad family history, but we can rewrite it. We can restore it. And God can make it. When God restores something, he makes it better than new. We can determine not to repeat those things in our generation. And um, above in Jonestown, uh, you know, I wrote this book centering around that story to to really defy the shame and the bad family history that marked my life. But not just from what my family went through who made the decisions to be in Jonestown, but my bad family history, my mistakes, Mm -hmm. my failure, failing to comfort my kids or me being uh, at times prideful and refusing to bend. Um, Who I used to be, me taking away the labels and the narratives that I had written from the past to rewrite something new and magnificent today. Um, I'll close with this, above the bodies in Jonestown, if you look and search for it, above there was a chair over the bodies where Jim Jones would sit. And there was a sign there. And the sign read this, those that do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Wow. Wow. And so today, if I can share with your listeners anything, don't forget your history. Repent for family history that you've contributed to and others have contributed to and watch God restore it for the next generation. Wow. That's incredible because my next question was going to be, where do we start? And that's, and you just nailed it right there. Well, listen, Ed, can you, you know, would you share with uh, the audience where they can find you, how they can be in contact with you, where they can find your book? And again, I say this very sincerely. It's, it's a book really, really worth uh, picking up. You know, it, it does. It is faith-based. It's, it's, there's a lot of biblical in there. And, and maybe some of my viewers are not, you know, associated with God or the spiritual world, but there is plenty there for you too. Yes. yes. And I really wrote it, Kevin. Uh, yeah. One of the things that we've had, we've had several people re- review the book. And once, what, what's been a constant theme is people who are saying, even though there are biblical stories, mm. it was written so anyone, believer or not, and sometimes they use the term religious or not, could see themselves in the story. Absolutely agree. So we, we, I really wrote it with that heart in mind. And uh, you can get a copy of Be a Giant Killer. It's sold on Amazon, uh, also in Walmart and Barnes and Noble. Very nice. uh, I, I'd love for you to get it through Amazon. And if you love it, to give us a great review on it. Uh, you can visit my website, which is ednorwood.com, and you'll see some links to the book there. And then I'd love to connect with some of your listeners on social media. 
I'm on Instagram under champions underscored unleashed. And of course on Facebook and LinkedIn, just put in my name, Ed Norwood, and you'll see me pop up. Well, you know, thank you for sharing that. Of course, all of that we'll put in the show notes so that everybody can get to it. But um, I got to tell you, this happens to me um, from time to time that I'll do a podcast and, uh, and I just say to myself, I did not see this podcast coming. And this is certainly wow. one of those It's just really wow. tremendous what you've Thank offered you. our Thank audience. You. And, you know, Thank it's you. just clear to me that you're a beautiful human being and I thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me and to speak to the audience and I hope a lot of people watch this it will be worth it well what a platform that you are building and my prayer for you as you grow is that uh, God would just give you people in exchange for your lives as you have sold into people that God would restore people back to you Mm -hmm. Um, people of favor people of influence people of syndication that God would send people uh, who can come in and enrich the lives of your listeners, but really also enrich your life and extend your voice to the next generation. Um, Praying that uh, you continue to do the great work that you're doing. Thank you again for sharing this awesome platform with me. The privilege is mine. And thank you so much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Ed Norwood, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. 